Hi, I'm Dan Ashley, the evening news anchor for ABC 7 News in San Francisco, and I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe, healthy and comfortable during these very challenging times. I am also a proud board member of the Commonwealth Club, one of our most important Bay Area institutions. The club has been hosting wonderful events with exciting speakers and topics in the Bay Area for over a century. In times of crisis, good information and strong connections in our community are especially important. And during the current COVID-19 crisis, the club has really stepped up. Since March 6th, the club has brought you over 100 live streamed events with speakers and panelists, including past governors, secretaries of state, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, mayors, county supervisors, respected medical experts, the president of the University of California, experts on anxiety and happiness in times of stress, and many, many more. Every program includes a live chat. So you and viewers all over the Bay Area and beyond have been able to ask these experts the questions that are on your minds. Every program has been neutral and unbiased in true Commonwealth Club style to get to the bottom of the issues that are so drastically affecting our lives. The club has done all this public service despite being profoundly affected by the crisis. The inability to hold events for the past two months has forced the club to cut its budget and staffing by 50%. The remaining staff are working from home to bring the community these valuable and informative live streamed programs. The club needs your support to continue its shelter at home programming. Please make a tax deductible donation to the club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the Commonwealth Club website commonwealthclub.org. We need the club to be here in the months and years ahead to help inform and educate as we figure out how to get our society and our economy safely moving again, consider changes to the way we live and work as a result of this crisis and take steps to prevent a future pandemic. Once again, please support the Commonwealth Club now by texting the word donate to 329-4231. That is donate to 329-4231 or visit the website commonwealthclub.org. I want to personally thank you for supporting one of our community's truly great organizations. I'll see you on ABC 7 News and at the Commonwealth Club. Stay safe. Greetings. I'm Dr. Robert Kilpatrick, the chair of the Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum at the Commonwealth Club of California in San Francisco. And due to the COVID-19 crisis, all of our programming is currently online. That has proved to be extremely challenging. So tonight's program and the club's new virtual efforts are generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We're grateful for their support and hope that others, including you, will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. Well, I am delighted to introduce a wonderful talk today. It's in our Healthy Society series, and the title is Unlearn Your Pain, Freeing Your Body from Chronic Pain. Um, and we have a world-renowned thought leader in this field as our guest today, Dr. Um, Howard Schubner. He is uh, the director of the Mind Body Medicine Center at Providence Ho Hospital in Smithfield, and he's also a clinical professor of medicine at Michigan State University College School of Human medicine. And before uh, Howard uh, starts talking to us, I'd like to encourage you to send in your questions. Uh, you will be experiencing this program on YouTube, and there's a, a, a question or a chat box there. So uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Without further ado, Howard, welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. Thank you, Ravi. It's so, I'm such, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, and I've really enjoyed um, our interactions with the club and with everybody involved with it. 
Tamara Gurren uh, invited me and I'm indebted to her and I'll be talking about her a little bit in a few minutes. I see, Robbie, you're coming in from your beautiful office with the wood panels and the bookshelves. And you can see I'm coming to you from my home office in my sterile uh, spare bedroom. But uh, what I'm hoping to do today is really uh, give everyone a different sense of what pain is all about. It turns out that our views of pain are actually kind of antiquated and advances in the last couple of decades in neuroscience have shed light on what pain actually is and how we can uh, address it. And so uh, these are some disclosures that I have, some consulting that I do, some books I've written, etc. And what I'm hoping to do is give you a different view about pain in a way that will change how you think about pain and basically will um, rock uh, your view of pain. So you're familiar with earworms, right? Uh, earworm is something that gets stuck in our brain and uh, it's sometimes hard to get out. Uh, the, uh, the people at St. Andrews University did a little study apparently and they discovered that this song uh, is actually the number one. We will, we will rock you. <laughs> the number one earworm. Uh, and we're trying to understand that earworms are neural circuits in the brain, something that our brain learns. It tends to be repetitive. And the harder we try to get rid of it, the more it sticks around. And as you'll see, that's actually a good analogy. Just in case you didn't catch it the first time. <laughs> it turns out that the rates of chronic pain have doubled in the past 20 years. No one knows why that is happening. I'm going to give you a little bit of speculation on why that might be at the end of this talk. But I will tell you one thing. It's not due to changes in our bodies. Uh, many of you may know that there's up to a third of Americans, roughly, have some form of chronic pain. If you take back pain and neck pain and headaches, that accounts for the majority of it. More people have chronic pain, and it costs more money to our society than cancer, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes combined. It is a huge, along with depression, is the major cause of disability in this country and worldwide. And what has happened with low back pain in the last decade or two, we've had tremendous increases in invasive procedures, opioids, injections, MRIs, and surgery for back pain. And despite all of our best efforts in treatment, we're seeing an increase in disability for back pain. And in fact, it might be that in part, I'm going to challenge our thinking on this, that these invasive inter interventions actually may be in part the cause of increasing pain. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, how are we doing with these kind of invasive treatments? Well, it turns out there have been zero studies that have shown research randomized controlled trials that have shown that surgery is actually a superior form of treatment for low back pain compared to exercise or physical therapy or actually just doing nothing. There have been some surgical trials that have been sham surgery trials for knee pain and, and um, uh, uh, back pain due to um, compression fractures. Uh, and those studies have shown that the People who got the actual surgery had decrease in pain, but people who got the sham surgery had an equal amount of decrease in pain, suggesting that the surgery was actually working as a placebo effect. An amazing uh, concept to, to rock our world in the world of pain because we're now spending about $20 billion a year on back surgeries. How about injections for back pain? The evidence shows that injections work, they lower pain, but do they work better in randomized controlled trials than placebo injections? And the answer basically is no. 
How about psychological treatments for chronic low back pain? Cognitive behavioral therapy and behavioral therapies are the main uh, pain psychology um, treatments that have been used across the country, but yet they show very weak effects in actually reducing pain. How about mindfulness? We're talking to people from San Francisco and California. I have been a mindfulness practitioner and teacher for 20 years now. I believe that everyone should learn mindfulness uh, in starting with school children. But yet the research shows that when you take people with chronic pain, low back pain and other chronic pain, and you say, well, we'll give you mindfulness for that. The data shows that it's not very effective. It's not more effective than cognitive behavioral therapy. There is no evidence of sustained long-term uh, decreases in pain with mindfulness. Why is that? I will explain that to you, hopefully, in a couple of minutes. So chronic pain, if you look at the world of chronic pain, it's assumed that chronic pain is a biological problem. It's structural. There's something wrong with the body, and there's something wrong in the brain. The treatments for if you go to a chronic pain center is multidisciplinary. We'll give you a little physical therapy, a little psych psychological treatment, a little, phys a little uh, acupuncture, a little mindfulness, uh, maybe some injections. We'll do a little bit of everything. And what we are finding is these treatments are not particularly effective in actually reducing pain. What, you, what happens when you go to a, a pain center is they will say, well, we don't know why you're having pain. We can't cure your pain but we can help you live with it better. We can help you cope with it. And most people, if you've ever been in chronic pain that takes your breath away, chronic pain that makes every day a struggle to get through is not very encouraging. We can do better. The limitations of these current approaches is a specific diagnosis of the cause of pain is not actually made because we, we're saying we don't know. And again, we think we can do better than that. What we're finding is that people are just, as I mentioned, trying to help people cope. The pain is presumed to be incurable. And emotional processing, dealing with emotions, is not actively encouraged. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about that. I have a good friend named Charlie Merrill. He's a physical therapist in Boulder, Colorado. Wonderful colleague. We teach together. And his son, Matt, and he were on vacation a couple of years ago in Japan. Uh, Matt was young and uh, they were on vacation with uh, Charlie's two kids, his wife, who was his second wife, and her two kids. And they were going for a hike and all of a sudden Matt had this horrible leg pain. Nothing happened to him, he didn't fall, but he had this tremendous leg pain. He could barely walk. And Charlie stopped, they couldn't go on the hike. Charlie stopped. He looked at his leg. There didn't seem to be anything wrong with him. And Charlie said to Matt, hey, Matt, you know, sometimes when we get pain, there's something bothering us. There's something that's just going on that's bothersome. And is there something bothering you, buddy? And Charlie just waited. And within 15 seconds, Matt started to have a little tear come in his eye. And pretty soon he was sobbing. He's saying, I miss my mom. He hadn't been away from his mom for that amount of time. And Charlie said, you know, that's okay. We're going to call your mom tonight. I can understand you miss her. She's, you wish she was here. You wish you could talk to her and be with her, but you're going to see her soon. And, and I understand. And it's okay. We're all, we're all feeling that. Your sister's feeling like she's missing her too. And Matt let the tears out. Charlie gave him a big hug. And his pain vanished on the spot, and he was fine. He went for a hike. What if Charlie had taken Matt? He said, oh, my God, your leg's really bad. Let's go to the hospital right now. And they put him in, and they give him crutches, and they say, don't walk on it. And somebody takes an x-ray, and they say, oh, there's a little spot on it. And fear develops, and worry develops. This could become a, um, an earworm. This could become an earworm of pain, a neural circuit of pain that could get worse over time rather than better over time. But Charlie recognized the underlying cause of the pain was not a physical problem. It was something that was going on emotionally for Matt. 
Let me tell you another story about a woman named Ellen. I saw her a few years ago. She's in her mid-50s. She had severe back pain. She worked at an auto factory here in our beautiful auto capital of Detroit. And uh, she, was, she had such severe pain one day, she had to be literally carried out on a stretcher from the, from the plant. This went on for nine years. She had several courses of physical therapy, injections, medication. She was on disability. Over time, the pain spread, and over time, it worsened. This is her exam. She had no radiation of pain to her legs. There was no evidence of nerve compression. But yet her MRI looks horrible. Look at this MRI. Can you imagine someone showing you an MRI of your back with this disc bulging and arthritis and disc space narrowing and compression and all this stuff? This looks horrible. And she was scheduled for a surgery. For some reason, she called me. And uh, I talked her on the phone, and she came in for an evaluation. And I explained to her, after a clear evaluation, I'll tell you more about that in a minute, what was wrong with her. And what was wrong with her had nothing to do with this MRI findings, which is shocking, because the data shows that if you're in your 50s, 80% of healthy, normal people with no pain have disc degeneration. It's even 50% of 30-year-olds have this. This are normal findings. These rise with age. This is like grain of the spine. It's like getting gray hair. You don't, it doesn't hurt unless you look in the mirror. It happens to everybody. Disc bulging occurs normally in 40% of 30-year-olds, 60% of 50-year-olds, and the other findings are similar. Back pain does not rise with age. Back pain rises in the society to the 30s and 50s, and then it levels off. It doesn't go up with age. These findings are normal abnormalities. They're not the cause of her pain. This lady canceled her surgery three weeks later because she was pain-free after nine years. What did we do? We interrupted the neural circuit that was causing her pain by making an accurate diagnosis and helping her unravel the neural circuit or the horrible earworm that was causing her severe pain. She actually got a recurrence of pain about six months later. She called me up. She said, you know, Dr. Schubiner, I, I the other day I was vacuuming and I got pain again. And I said, oh, did you pull your back? What did you do? She said, no. I sat down and I thought about what was going on in my life. And I realized that that morning I'd gotten a, we had gotten a letter from the Department of Defense. My daughter was being shipped out to be deployed in the Middle East. And that, I realized that was the cause of my back pain. Just like Matt, my, my, son's, my uh, friend's son, uh, she realized the actual underlying cause of that pain, and that allowed her to unravel the neural circuit and, and actually turn it off. What proportion of chronic conditions like anxiety, depression, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, headaches, pelvic pain syndromes, and chronic neck and back pain are actually brain-induced, are actually neural circuit, are actually occurring in the absence of a structural problem. The answer is roughly in the 90% range. This in and of itself is clearly a revolutionary idea. People might think I'm a stark raving lunatic, for saying this, but this is what the data supports. So what we're doing is first we're ruling out a clear structural disorder. For headaches, it's simple. You get an MRI of your brain, you make sure you don't have a bleed, a tumor, an infection, uh, a, a vasculitis, you make sure there's no dental, sinus problem, ear problem. And 98, roughly 98% 98 of people fall into what we call primary headaches migraine, tension headache, occipital neuralgia, there's no structural problem. These are neural circuits in the brain. But we go further than that and we rule in a neural circuit disorder. Circumstantial evidence for neural circuit disorder is people who have other disorders, we'll see this in a minute when I do my next case, other disorders that are similar. People have a history of anxiety or depression or irritable bowel and now are having back pain. People who have had adverse childhood events or have significant stressful life situations that have occurred in their life. 
But we have something we call confirmatory evidence, which actually rules in and confirms that the problem is a neural circuit problem. And we do this by looking carefully at the symptoms, at the pain itself. If doctors haven't been able to pinpoint the cause of the pain or they've given it a name, like pudendal neuralgia or occipital neuralgia or fibromyalgia, these are names which just mean you have pain. They are not a specific diagnosis. They do not indicate a structural problem in the body. And then we look at the, at the pain itself. If it's on the whole side of the body or the whole arm or the whole leg, that's unlikely to be a nerve problem because nerve problems don't do that by and large if it occurs in mirror images, both sides of the body, if the pain occurs after an injury, but then it lasts long after the injury healed. The pain started with an injury, and then it's persisting due to neural circuits in the brain that have taken over. The pain shifts from one location in the body to another. That's because the neural circuits are turning off in one area and turning on in another area. This is classic for headaches. It's classic for fibromyalgia and it commonly occurs in people with back pain. The pain spreads over time, and the pain varies. It turns on and off. Sometimes it occurs when you're sitting. Sometimes it occurs when you're not sitting. And it can be triggered by things that are innocuous, like the air or wind or light or sound or foods or smells or cold. And when we see this, what we're seeing is that these are definitively diagnosing neural circuits in the brain as the cause of pain. And that's what I did with the lady that I was telling you about with the back pain. And that's what happened with the next patient we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. So what do we know about pain? What is the neuroscience telling us? It's telling us there's something called predictive coding. It turns out that our brain is powerful. Our brain can cause conversion disorder where people can have loss of sight, loss of the ability to speak, loss of movement of an arm or leg, purely because of stress and the brain creating this problem. And it's not that uncommon. Um, people can have symptoms that are contagious. In fact, in, in Germany, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, back pain was high in West Germany and low in East Germany. And over time, as these populations mixed, back pain rose in East Germany to the levels of back of, of um, West Germany. Um, how many of you have ever felt that your cell phone was vibrating in your pocket when in fact it wasn't? That's a form of a hallucination. Our brain can create things that are just not actually there, but are real because our brain creates everything that we feel. And how many of you know where you hold stress in your body? So the story I like to tell that describes predictive coding is that uh, every morning, my wife has the same breakfast, yogurt, granola, slice of apple. A couple of summers ago, she got up early. It was dark. She had an extra slice. She brought it up to the bedroom. She said, here, honey. And she gave me the slice and I took a bite of it. I didn't see it. I took a bite and I had this strong, disgusting taste in my mouth like she had given me a rotten apple. It turned out that day it was a peach. My brain was expecting apple, the crunch but it got the softness of a peach. And even though the peach was sweet, I got a disgusting taste in my mouth to warn me, to alert me. My brain was trying to protect me and it was predicting what was, what was going on, but it was mistaken. And our brain can make mistakes like that, interpreting normal sensations as abnormal. Our brain creates what we see, what we hear, and what we feel. And pain is there to protect us. So if you're chasing a deer, you're running across the savanna, and you get a broken ankle, you want pain because your brain will create pain due to that broken ankle. The broken ankle can't create pain in and of itself. It's only your brain that can create pain. Now, if you're running from a lion and you break an ankle, your brain will not create pain because your life is in danger. Pain is an opinion that our brain makes. It's a decision that our brain chooses to turn it on if we're touching a hot stove, if we break an ankle, or to not turn it on, as in this situation where a friend of mine shot a nail in his hand inadvertently at a construction site, and he was all alone. He had zero pain, no pain at all. He was alone. His brain decided it was more important, apparently, for him to drive to the hospital, which he did. He was not in shock than to be alone at a construction site 
in severe pain. So his brain turned off pain, even though there was a physical injury. In this case, this guy in Britain several years ago stepped on a nail. The nail went clear through his boot. He had tremendous pain at a work site. They rushed him to the hospital. They gave him IV pain medication. When they took the boot off, they found the nail was precisely between his toes. There was no injury at all. His brain had created that pain because it was predicting that he was in danger and it was predicting he needed help. And that pain is real because all pain is created by the brain. And the pain that he has is every bit as real as the pain that anybody else has if they have a physical injury because pain comes from the brain. And this final story on this pain education block is I met a doctor a few years ago who was in the Vietnam War as a young man. He got severely injured with a shrapnel wound to his leg. A lot of guys died. He got medevaced out. His injuries heal and is healed, and his brain turned off the danger alarm mechanism that was causing pain. And he was fine, pain-free. About 20 years later, he was walking down the street with his wife, and he was startled by the sound of a helicopter in the sky. And all of a sudden, he got the same pain in his leg that he had had 20 years earlier. His brain had learned that pain as an earworm, as a neural circuit, and it remembered it. And then it had activated it at the trigger, the triggering sound of the helicopter. And that's what I was talking about before when pain is triggered by sounds and light and smells um, and uh, foods and computer screens and changes in the weather. These are triggers that are triggering neural circuits in the brain. So pain is dynamic. It's real. It's not imaginary. All pain is real. All pain is activated by the brain, and pain can be triggered either in the presence of tissue damage or in the absence of tissue damage. And as I said before, the revolutionary thing is that the majority of chronic pain is triggered in the absence of tissue damage. Each case needs to be evaluated individually to make sure that that's the case. But if someone says that pain is all in your head, this is what I say to my patients, they're either ignorant or cruel because the pain is not imaginary. It's real. It's not your fault. You're not crazy. You're not mentally ill. We're not saying that the pain is all in your head. What we're saying is the pain is real, but it's created by the brain. And that gives us an in to help people get better rather than helping them just cope with pain, which is de uh, deemed to be incurable. So I show this drawing to all my patients. The danger signal in the brain can be triggered by injury or it can be triggered by stress and emotions. People who have adverse childhood events, their danger signal gets sensitized early in life when they've felt unsafe. So they're more likely to develop pain, anxiety, depression, fatigue, insomnia, when later life stressors occur because our brain is there as a neural circuit, as an alarm mechanism to tell us there's something wrong. Just as Charlie's son brain was telling him there was something wrong in his life with the, him missing his mom, and my brain was telling me there was something wrong in that, in that peach that I took uh, a bite of. Um, what happens is, is that the symptoms lead to fear and worry and anxiety and focus on them. And the more we focus on the symptoms, the more we worry about them, the more that activates and reinforces the danger signal. And this vicious cycle of pain leading to fear, leading to more pain, is the precise cause of most chronic pain and why most people with chronic pain get worse over time and the pain tends to spread over time. This study shows that people given an emotional event had the exact same findings in their brain as people given a physical injury. Emotional pain and physical pain are the same as far as the brain is concerned. Danger is danger. Physical danger or emotional danger, our brain reacts and can, can produce pain in either of those settings. People with chronic low back pain, if you look at the left, uh, left slide here, uh, the blue line is emotional laden areas. People with acute back pain, uh, they have low emotion and high somatosensory areas, but people with chronic back pain, it's basically an emotion-related circuitry increase. It's shocking to think about chronic back pain being 
psychological being an emotional problem as opposed to a physical problem. That's not always the case, but it's mostly the case. So what we're doing is we're making an accurate diagnosis. We're educating people on the nature of pain, just as I've tried to educate you here. And we're helping people reduce the fear of pain to rewire the neural circuits. We're giving people graded exposure to their triggers by gradually beginning to walk more or sit more or bend more. <clears throat> um, and then sometimes we have to deal with the emotional situations in their life or help them make changes in their life. So the reason I'm giving this talk today is because of Tamara. Tamara is part of um, Commonwealth Club. And uh, a few years ago, she woke up with left arm pain. And then she had swelling. And then one finger curled up. How scary is that when your, your arm, your, your hand is hurting, your fingers are curled up. And two weeks later, it spread to her other arm. This is exactly what I was talking about by how we diagnose neural circuit pain. Over time, it got worse. She felt like fire ants. She couldn't write. She couldn't hold things. She was told she had carpal tunnel syndrome, but that wasn't true. Later, it was changed to chronic regional pain syndrome, which means you have severe pain, and we don't know why. She had a history of back pain, migraine headaches, fatigue, anxiety, neck pain, depression. And there was a significant stress in her life just prior to the onset of these symptoms. She tried everything under the sun to try to help her from a medical point of view to get better, but nothing worked. This is what her hands look like. Look at that redness, look at the swelling. Uh, and uh, you can see they're kind of uh, bent a little bit. This is horrible, this is so scary, such horrible thing to live through. And what happened to her is she kept searching and she kept searching and she came across the work of Dr. Sarno, who was my teacher. And I met him in 2002, he had been doing this work for 30 years by that time. And she realized that she had a psychosomatic condition. She wasn't injured, even though her hands looked horrible and they felt horrible, they weren't actually damaged. She started to reduce her fear. She started to move her hands a little bit more rather than less. She started to work uh, using mindful meditation. Here, mindful meditation is extremely valuable because mindful meditation now is being used in the face of understanding that her physical symptoms are caused by her brain and they are transitory and that she can get better. And after three months, she started to get better. Her pain went down and her fingers released a while later. And she's now fine. And she wrote this book. So here's a plug for Tamara's book to find the verdict, How I Defeated Chronic Pain. It's available as an ebook. So... This is a perfect example of using the knowledge of brain science and using the knowledge of medicine to take a horrible, incurable, seemingly incurable situation and changing your brain. So another way to think of these neural circuit disorders, another name is psychophysiologic disorders. Stress and unresolved emotions can create real physical pain in the absence of a disease process in the body. The symptoms are a message. They're telling us something. It's our job to encode the message and figure out what's going on in our life. And we can reverse this most of the time by changing the neural circuits, by decreasing our fear of them, our focus on them, by doing mindfulness practice, by dealing with emotions, by gradually doing more rather than less without invasive interventions. So. Why has pain increased in our society? Why has pain doubled in our society over the last 20 years? Well, no one knows. I leave a few of these for you as possibilities because the more people feel unsafe in their lives, the more likely it is that is their brain is going to feel unsafe and their brain may, be, may start activating not only pain, but possibly depression, fatigue, insomnia, anxiety. And we as a medical profession have medicalized all these things. And when you have a true medical problem, obviously I'm the first one as a physician to tell you to get excellent medical care. But when you medicalize the, the kinds of symptoms that are actually neural circuit symptoms, we're actually being counterproductive. We're making people worse. So 
There's a shift in thinking. This is a paradigm shift about these disorders. It recognizes the power of the brain. It challenges our current treatments, and it off, but it offers the cost for the potential for low-cost, patient-centered treatments for ailments which are now epidemic in our society and worldwide. Here are some websites. Here's a way to reach me. And I want to call Robbie back. Robbie, are you still there? You haven't fallen asleep? <laughs> well, you know, uh, that was, I'm, I'm almost speechless, Howard. It was such um, uh, an incredibly revealing uh, presentation. And I have a load of questions, and I know the audience does too. But before we move into that, I want to alert people to your two books, uh, which I have read, and they are fabulous. Uh, the first one has a title very similar to today's talk, Unlearn Your Pain, and it's a 20 day, 28 day process to re reprogram your brain and a kind of a workbook, right? Yeah. Where people can kind of work through the issues in their life. And the second one, I think, was your first one Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression. There are very few uh, physicians and therapists who are actually embracing this model. It's a growing number. We think a tipping point will happen sooner or later. Uh, you can't keep a good idea down forever as our, as our thinking. Uh, but this is based in science. This is, actually, this is just medical fact, scientific fact, as far as we're concerned. And, uh, but there are so few physicians who are really aware of this. Most of my patients who realize that they have an actual mind-body condition instead of the diagnosis of structural problems that they were told, ask me this question, why has my doctor not aware of this? Why has my doctor not told me about this? Um, so the reason I wrote this as a workbook was so people who are in areas where their physicians are not quite uh, aware of this can kind of begin to work on it on their own. And that's what Tamara did. She did a lot of this work on her own. Well, th that's why I recommend these books, because it's a natural um, follow-up to the, to the talk today. And also, um, I wanted to recommend Tamara's book. Uh, I've looked at hers, how I, how I Defeated Chronic Pain, because hers is very much a human interest story, and she brought you to us. So, you know, it's wheels within wheels, and, and I think this is all extremely encouraging. One of the things that bothers me is, is a point you just made a moment ago, Howard, which is, you know, what is the prevalence of doctors who are trained to understand this model of pain? Because my experience is very often doctors prescribe pain medication, analgesics, opioid crisis, and it, wouldn't it be true to say that pain meds actually silence the message that is being brought to us? Yeah, that's a really, uh, really good point. Uh, a lot of the uh, opioids obviously have been a disaster uh, nationally and internationally. Um, they've never been shown to actually be effective in treatment of chronic pain. Um, and they tend to, and the invasive procedures that I was talking about, tends to reinforce the idea that there's something physically wrong. So it takes away from uh, the, uh, you know, the ability to kind of hear the message and try to figure out what underlying problem is. I mean, obviously there's, there's some percentage of people who have chronic incurable pain, metastatic cancer pain, uh, a variety of inflammatory conditions that are severe. And, you know, I'm not recommending only psychological or mind body type treatment for, for those people. Uh, we're just saying that the majority of people actually do not have structural problems. And one of the questions that came in from the chat I'm seeing has to do with that point. And so if you take, um, if you take fibromyalgia, for example, every expert in the world, if the, if the diagnosis has been made carefully and accurately, you've ruled out rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and chronic inflammatory conditions. There is no structural problem in the body causing that pain. That's just a medical fact. Uh, headaches are the same thing, as I mentioned. Once you've ruled out structural problems in the brain or the teeth or the sinuses or the ears, 
90, you know, the vast majority, roughly 98%, any neurologist will tell you that, are what we call primary headaches. There's no structural problem causing them. The pain is real, but we're taking the step of explaining why the pain is there, which is due, in our, again, in our view, due to neural circuits in the brain. And the same is true for irritable bowel syndrome. There's no evidence of disease in the colon. Uh, if you take chronic pelvic pain, the diagnosis for the vast majority of chronic pelvic pain is pudendal neuralgia or pelvic floor dysfunction or vulvodynia or interstitial cystitis. And again, when you look closely at those, diagnos those diagnostic categories, you are not finding actual structural causes for the pain. The testing is normal. Um, and with back and neck pain, uh, we're estimating, it's really an estimate now. Uh, we're actually involved, actually involved in a study right now to see if we can accurately determine this. Uh, we did a small study in Boulder, Colorado, where we randomized people to our mind-body intervention compared to uh, a, a back injection. And uh, we were, uh, the two things of the 45, small study, but of the 45 people who were in that study, 43 of them had nothing wrong with their back based on our evaluation. Um, it's not that they didn't have pain. They had an average of pain of 10 years of chronic pain, uh, but 75% of them were pain-free in one month after this intervention. So that study hasn't been published yet, but it will be uh, hopefully by, uh, by next year. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in, in the talk today, there were, there were several amazing um, quotes, and the one that sticks with me is, pain is a decision the brain makes. So I'd like to clarify a point for our audience and for me as well. So if, if I was to say to you, oh, my foot hurts or my back hurts, is it true that you're saying that it's my, you know, that I'm feeling that in my my brain or it's processed in the brain? It's not actually pain that's in the foot or in the back. Well, the the you know there are nerve fibers obviously in all of our body, and those send signals to the brain. Right. And so if the if there's injury in the body, then those those what we call danger signals. They're not actually pain signals because only the brain can create pain. They're what we just call danger signals. Those signals are being sent to the brain, and the brain has to decide whether to turn on pain. Usually, when there's an injury, the brain will turn on pain. But it's still the fact because, as I showed you with the guy with the nail in his hand, he had an injury, but the brain didn't turn on pain. Right? That can happen. So it's still a decision the brain makes. What we're saying is that the brain can turn on pain in the absence of any structural injury. And that is the, that is the revolutionary thing <clears throat> that we're saying here. So that if, if you were to, you know, conduct uh, a vivisection experiment and say, you know, sever or tie off the nerves to a part, or you were to inject, you know, an extremely potent analgesic, where in, in that case where the, the person simply or the animal simply doesn't feel the pain and yet the, that would explain the, how the brain is in the, in the driver's seat, right? Well, people, with fan, people who have amputations commonly have pain in the, in the foot or arm that's been amputated. That's well known. Okay. That is brain-induced pain. Uh, I have a really sad story of, of a patient, a friend of mine is a a physiatrist, and he had a patient who had severe, severe back pain. And this guy was always, Doc, can you help me? My pain is horrible. I need medication. Doc, can you help me? And this guy, sadly, was in a horrible car accident. He had a transection of his spinal cord in the thoracic area. So this guy is completely paralyzed from the, from the chest down. He has no feeling at all. Wow. And uh, the doc my friend, the doctor, I went to see him in the hospital saying, oh, man, I'm, you know, this is horrible. I'm so sorry. And the first thing the guy said to him is, hey, doc, can you help me with my back pain? It's killing me. <laughs> I mean, it was, it's just shocking, shocking the, the uh, power of the brain. I, I, I mean, the, I think the information that you're imparting today is uh, it challenges certainly a lot of, of long held uh, beliefs. And again, just as a practical person and speaking on behalf of the audience, um, how, how, how can people who are listening to this find uh, someone trained to be able to help them in this way? 
Well, there's uh, the resources that I put at the um, on that last slide. Okay. Uh, the two websites, or uh, my website and the other two websites, um, have lists of physicians and practitioners okay. who are interested in this work. And we're training people all the time. We're training phys physical therapists. We're training physicians. We're training psychologists, social workers, life coaches, um, uh, okay. counselors, um, nurses, um, anybody we can because... When you really look closely at it, and that's why, again, if you, if you look at my book, people can actually figure that out for themselves most of the time. It's most of the time not that complicated because we've set forth this criteria for helping to understand that. What are the criteria of what, what the pain does and how it, how it acts and how it reacts? And what the, you know, and again, what the underlying diagnosis is that we are given by your physicians. Um, uh, so a lot of people can actually do it on their own. There's a lot of people who've read Dr. Sarno's books over the last 40 years, and there's a there's a documentary about him called All the Rage uh, that uh, honors him and talks about this. Uh, a lot of people have cured themselves by reading his book and applying the applying the principles. So uh, sometimes it's not always that easy. Sometimes it takes a lot of work. Tamara's case took a lot. She took a lot. Did a lot of work. Uh, it was a struggle for her. Uh, but she persevered, and uh, and that's why I'm here, and that's why she wrote her book. So it sounds like you can save all of us a lot of time if we go to your website. And what is the website address? Oh, I'm sorry. It's unlearnyourpain.com. Okay. Uh, I intend to go there almost immediately. Um, so I have a few questions from the audience I'd like to throw your way. Uh, and the first one... Actually, there have been several questions around this topic, so let me put it into one. Uh, there seems to be a lot of people interested in the concept of uh, inflammation. Yeah. And, and what, if any, relationship there is between inflammation and pain, and then people have specifically mentioned sciatica. Yeah, that's a great question. This comes up all the time. There's two types of inflammation, what I would call macro inflammation or localized inflammation versus mm -hmm. systemic, widespread, and what we would, I would call micro inflammation. Macro inflammation is what you can see when someone has an infected joint, when someone has a cellulitis, when someone has a strep throat, when someone has inflammation that's obvious, a rheumatoid arthritis is macro inflammation. And that can clear that clearly is involved with uh, tissue damage and nerve receptors that are sending danger signals to the brain. So pain can clearly occur with macro inflammation. Micro inflammation, oftentimes people are saying that's the cause of my pain, but it's but you can't see it. It's everywhere. But everyone has micro inflammation. Everyone has some degree of inflammation in their body. And that can be furthered by stress. It can be made worse by our diets, um, by the environment. All sorts of things uh, can cause this kind of low-level microinflammation. But that is not a cause of pain. That yeah. is a cause of things that can hurt you over time. Uh, you know, if I was a vegan, uh, maybe I would have live longer, have less chances of having a heart attack. Uh, so I'm accepting a bit of micro inflammation in my body, for example, by eating meat, but nevertheless, that's not a cause of pain. So I think it's really important to distinguish those because somehow people have the idea that this low level of micro inflammation is causing pain. And, and I do not believe uh, that that is the case. Sciatica, sciatic pain means pain shooting down the leg from the sciatic nerve. And one of the nerves kind of that can have two causes, um, either, oh, sorry, I'm getting a message here on the screen. Can you hear me all right? Yes, sure. Okay, great. So uh, sciatic pain can be caused by nerve root, in, nerve root pressure from a very large disc, and sometimes mm -hmm. most of those will heal on their own, but that's a structural problem. Sometimes people will need surgery if that gets worse. Um, uh, but sciatic pain can be caused by the brain. So in that situation, you need a careful diagnostic assessment uh, 
to figure out if it's a structural problem causing pain or, or it's the brain causing pain. Thank you. Um, I know a couple of people who have uh, used some complementary options, and we actually have a question specifically about Feldenkrais method. Uh, I know someone who just has a weekly treatment. Do you think that that has a role to play? There are many, many ways. What we're trying to do is calm the brain. Okay. Right? Where we're trying to calm the brain down. And Feldenkrais is a great way to calm the brain down. Mindfulness meditation is a great way. Uh, uh, acupuncture can be a great way. Um, uh, you know, there's just so many, so many somatic breathing, breath work, so many ways of calming the brain. What we're doing is we're helping people to understand that by calming, if in the situation of chronic pain that is due to neural circuits in the brain, that's all you need is to calm the brain. And however you do it, uh, it's great. It will be successful. The placebo effect consists of people um, having an explanation for what's wrong with them, having a, a technique that they can use, having a practitioner that they trust and having hope and optimism. And so when you put all those things together, you get a strong placebo effect. Placebo effect is all you need for brain-induced pain. And so what I do, in a sense, is a placebo effect. I'm helping people heal themselves by harnessing the power of their own brain. And whether you do that through other methods that are body-focused methods or whatever, Feldenkrais, that's fine, but I see my view is that if, if people who are doing Feldenkrais and acupuncture and physical therapy could, would also understand this, these concepts of brain-induced pain, I think it'll make their work even more uh, powerful, even more successful. You know, I, um, I can't think of a time uh, where this has been been more needed than now. Uh, one, one of the slides near near the end of your and listed some things such as uh, income, you know, economic inequality, and racism, and other, you know, and and due to social media, due to the twenty four seven news, you know, due to perhaps the slightly more negative bias of of even what we call news nowadays compared to when we were younger. Uh, I find myself uh, needing to occasionally have news fast. I need to restrict what I what I see because I can't take it all in. So when you mention uh, calming the brain, I just wonder uh, if you can help us. We don't have a lot of time left, but if you can help us think practically about the things that we should be thinking about in terms of that mind body uh, connection, like some simple things we can actually do to either prevent pain or begin to interact with it to reduce it? Yeah, that's a great question, Ravi. Um, first of all, it's kind of understanding what our own needs are. Healthcare is critical, and that's what you're doing by saying you need a news break every now and then. We have definitely stopped watching some some, you know, we, 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 we're okay reading the paper, but watching it on TV sometimes is a little too much. Um, mm -hmm. What do we need for self-care? That's one thing. The other thing is, what can we do to help? If someone, if you can act, you know, instead of, if you can act to, to donate, to help, uh, that's something that's critical because you feel like you, you're, you know, you're doing something to be part of this. And thirdly, there's always been and there always will be crises. We're in huge crisis right now. But crisis is also an opportunity. Crisis is always an opportunity for people to come together, to connect, to heal, to, to relate to each other, and to do things that are to bring out the best in humanity. And sometimes crisis brings out the worst in humanity. But if we can be uh, careful and try to bring out our best, uh, I think those are the things that I would suggest. Thank you. I've got a question here that really deals with, uh, with outliers, I think. So the, the question says, uh, Dr. Sarno says that 5% of his patients that he, tr that he treated do not get better. C could you talk about this 5% uh, 
uh, why is this happening, uh, and and, uh, and and what what can we do about that? Yeah, um, that that number is you know not really known. That's an estimate that, that Dr. Sarno made. You know maybe it's higher. Uh, you know we really don't know. But it's the work that I'm suggesting is simple in many ways, but it's not always easy. I mean, if you have a powerful history of long history of childhood trauma, overcoming that may take a lot of work and a lot of time. If you have tremendous fear of the sensations and the pain you're having, to unravel that may be difficult. If you are having a really hard time buying into this model and understanding that there's actually nothing seriously wrong, that's going to really make it hard. And I hear about people with this all the time because they have this, the earworm in their head is my body's damaged, my body's damaged, my body's damaged because it only makes sense. I mean, that's what pain is. Pain is a message that your body's damaged. Everyone knows that. And what we're saying is that it's not always the case. And so to parse that out and distinguish that, distinguish that can be difficult. So this is hard work for a lot of people. Um, yeah. So then something like uh, uh, hip or sacroiliac arthritis, where there's um, a structural or a, and a physical dysfunction, that is not, quote unquote, all in the mind. Right. Well, all people have evidence of our most people, adults and older people have evidence of arthritis on X-ray. Mm -hmm. So if you just took x-rays of everybody, we would all have some degree of arthritis seen. But mm -hmm. studies show that that having uh, x-ray evidence of arthritis is is not does not correlate with actually having pain. So there's a lot of wear and tear on our joints that you can find on x-ray that are not causing pain. So asymptomatic people without pain have abnormal x-rays most of the time. Now, severe arthritis, some people need new hips, some people need new knees, that's clearly the case. So arthritis can be progressive and it can certainly be the cause of pain that needs medical treatment. That's why I showed that slide of trying to distinguish the two and trying to help understand <clears throat> what is neural circuit pain versus structural pain. And some people clearly have a combination of the two. Well, for those of our audience who now have writer's cramp because they were trying to copy all of your slides, <laughs> I have good news, and I probably should have announced this in the very beginning, which is that within a few days or over a week or so, the uh, mm -hmm. video and the audio presentation will be available free of charge on the website. So the people can forward that to friends and family and uh, review everything you said and see, see those slides, which is a really good thing. Um, I think we've got uh, time for uh, one or two more short questions. Um, I think um, for me, at the end of the day, one of the big takeaways is pretty much everything you've talked about for me is understood under the umbrella of, of excellent self-care. That is to say, you know, literally being connected and aware of what's going on in my body. Would you, would you say that's true? Yeah. Um, if we are aware of what's going on in our body and in our lives, what's going on in our world, in our mind, uh, how we're reacting to things, you know, we're introspective, uh, we practice self-care, we're going to be better off. But stresses are always going to occur, and the brain is there as a protector. The brain is there mm -hmm. subconsciously to alert us to problems. And so I get pain. You know, what happens to me, it happens to everyone. I think it's this, this idea of kind of these mind-body disorders are, <clears throat> they're just normal. You know, they're how our, our brains work. They're there to protect us. So um, is, is there any, anything you'd like to say to our, our audience uh, in closing uh, that you'd like them to, you know, walk away from this presentation knowing more about. Yeah, I appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, and to talk to you and, and everybody at the Commonwealth Club. It's been an honor, as I said at the beginning. I would say two things. One is 
remember this, the reign of pain lies mainly in the brain. <laughs> if you know that, that's a good thing. And secondly, think twice. This is what my mother told me. She always said when I was a teenager, think twice, Howard. Think once for yourself and then think once for me. And so if you get a pain or you know somebody who has pain or some of these other conditions, fatigue, insomnia, anxiety, and depression, think, okay, maybe there's something wrong. You know, I have a pain. Maybe there's something wrong in my body. Maybe I should see a doctor. Fine. That's a good thought. But then have a second thought. The second thought is, gee, maybe this could be a neural circuit. Maybe this could be an earworm. Maybe there's something going on in my life. Maybe this is a message that my brain is giving me that I'm doing too much or I'm overstretched or, or something's a thorn in my side or somebody's a pain in my neck. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you think twice, at least you're opening the possibility to understanding what the symptom is coming from, structural or non-structural or a combination of the two. Well, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I, I can't remember an hour where I learned so much, to be honest with you. Uh, and I highly recommend your two books, uh, Unlearn Your Pain and Unlearn Your Anxiety and Depression, partly because they're in a very user-friendly um, format. And there's a workbook component that allows any reader to, to kind of develop you know, their own understanding of their situation. Uh, the Commonwealth Club of California is delighted to have welcomed you today. Uh, I personally am pleased to have been able to speak with you. Uh, fabulous. And, you know, through the wonders of, of Zoom uh, with you in Michigan and, and, and me in California, it's been possible. Uh, you know, for 117 years, the Commonwealth Club of California has supported enlightened discussion. Uh, and I cannot think of any time in my long and fruitful life when that has been more important than it is now. Uh, I strongly encourage uh, everyone watching uh, to support the club to the extent that you can financially, make a donation. Uh, in a week or so, you'll be able to access the audio and, and the video of this program, and I encourage you to send it to your friends and family. Uh, it's been a marvelous time, Howard. Uh, I wish you well. Thank you for everything that you have done and you are doing. I thank our audience uh, for uh, being part of this, and I say thank you and good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Take care. <laughs>